Good afternoon. I, Chandrasekhar R, from Asian Institute of Design, extend you all a very warm welcome to the webinar. Uh, I'll be moderating this session, and if you have any questions, kindly post it on QA section, uh, which can be passed on to the presenters. Uh, before we start the webinar, let me provide a brief introduction about who we are and what are the intentions behind starting this uh, aided learning platform. Uh, Asian Institute of Design is an higher education institution uh, located in Bangalore, India, which primarily offers bachelor's and diploma courses in the field of animation, game programming, a game art, uh, design courses such as product design, user experience design, graphic designs, and technology courses like artificial intelligence and machine learning and data science. Uh, we focus more on student-centric approach uh, with an uh, emphasis on uh, uh, cognitive skills development as our, most of the courses are uh, focusing on skill development. Uh, our faculties are mostly drawn from the industries uh, who have been associated with uh, global studios across the world. And uh, if you look at our alumni and students uh, who have been uh, working with uh, leading studios and have been credited in the movies like Jungle Book, uh, Godzilla, The Lion King, recent movies, and also uh, games like uh, GAT, uh, GTA 5, Red Hat Redemption. So this itself validates uh, our teaching and learning processes. Uh, if you wish to know more about AAD or you want to be associated with AAD, so please visit Asian Institute of Design dot in or you can uh, reach us through any of our social media handles. Uh, now, what is the intention behind uh, starting Aided Learning Platform? Uh, aided Learning Platform is basically uh, created uh, with a single objective of knowledge for everyone. So uh, through Aided Learning Platform, uh, we are trying to reach out to uh, reputed institutions and industry experts worldwide and bring that knowledge on this platform uh, with the basic uh, motto of upskilling and reskilling and thus uh, contributing a bit to this uh, society. Uh, so uh, through this platform we have done three webinars and this is the fourth one in that process and hope uh, we'll be able to uh, you know provide what we desire to the society. Coming to today's webinar, uh, the topic use of technology in higher education. Uh, we thought that this uh, topic is very much apt in the current scenario where in the pandemic, uh, it was uh, made uh, most of the institutions or colleges or the universities to move online from offline. Uh, though it was not a deliberate approach, uh, including us, we, it was a very, you know, uh, adapting ourselves to the situation uh, which demanded us to go online. Uh, but when we go online, is it uh, really uh, what the students are expecting and we'll be able to deliver what they are expecting or are we just teaching what uh, to cover what we are supposed to do because we can't able to reach the campus? So in line with that, uh, COVID has brought certain positive aspects also. Uh, one is like, you know, uh, contributing collaboratively to share the knowledge, which is happening right now. Otherwise, this might, uh, would not have taught also. Also, uh, now coming to the pros of that is, okay, it is a collaborative blend learning across the globe. People are able to share, create content. But on the other hand, are the students very happy with the way the teaching is happening? Uh, are they able to, you know, uh, sitting idle at home uh, without much physical activities and just listening to the presentations, classes, are they able to gain what they really expect? So uh, is it just, you know, giving the presentations on Zoom or Google Meet or, uh, you know, Microsoft uh, tools, 
or is it something else which will take them beyond this expectations so for that i think uh, the one best example uh, should be a strategic approach how do we plan uh, to have a smooth transition from offline teaching to online teaching uh, because teaching is not the only thing associated with infrastructure the development of uh, you know assessments which are very much appropriate uh, to be for online learning uh, because there was always a debate whether we have to go online teaching or not but irrespective of that which was forced to you know go online most of the universities but i feel there was one institution which had a very deliberate strategic approach in uh, you know uh, implementing the teaching and learning processes and uh, pedagogies and it is a very smooth transition moving from uh, offline teaching to online teaching and uh, that is middle east college uh, sultanate of oman so we have today dr smita head of post graduate studies uh, at middle east college uh, who has phd in computational biology and a, a academic higher education practitioner from coventry university uk and uh, academy of higher education uk so she would be uh, talking about the significance of strategic approach to the use of technology in teaching and learning a case study of middle east college hope uh, that will provide a right direction for uh, most of the colleges and use it how to really have a smooth transition from offline to online so now i request uh, dr smita to take over thank you thank you chandra for uh, introducing me to the audience all right uh, a very uh, good morning good evening to all the uh, participants attending uh, this uh, webinar so as the moderator was uh, mentioning i will be uh, focusing on uh, the significance of having a strategic approach to the teaching and learning which led to the technology integration taking the case of uh, middle east college um uh, as we all know uh, all higher education institutions were unexpectedly put in a situation where teaching and learning has to take place online we know the situations were really challenging for all but there are higher education institutions which could deliver a remote uh, teaching uh, enabling their learners to remain connected and uh, engaged with their teachers but how quickly a higher education institution could adopt a remote or emergency remote online teaching to continue and sustain their teaching and learning activities is something to be uh, thought of so here is a, a global survey that was uh, conducted uh, uh, to know the impact of covid-19 on higher education around the world and it was conducted by the international association of universities which is acting as a voice of higher education to unesco uh, there are 424 universities and colleges from 109 countries have participated and as per the survey results we see that even though 67 percentage would migrate to a, a distance or a, a remote teaching mode 24 percentage had to totally discontinue all their academic activities however uh, middle east college never had an academic lockdown in fact we had a very quick and a smooth transition from on campus to online and of course this doesn't mean that middle east college was prepared to face a situation like pandemic but we were proactive by having a strategic approach to teaching and learning and this uh, teaching and uh, uh, learning uh, strategy 
uh, had led to the adoption of institutional pedagogic framework. And this uh, teaching and learning, which has got some, which is based on uh, educational philosophy and certain principles have led to uh, a pedagogic approach called the flip learning uh, model. Now, this uh, pedagogic approach had enabled the necessary uh, technology integration in our teaching and learning practices with sufficient infrastructure. So this helped us for an easy transformation from on campus to online. And what we find is that uh, if we have a planned strategic uh, approach with necessary systems and processes in place, in our case already in place, which had helped us in a greater way to offer a remote, uh, an emergency uh, remote uh, uh, teaching. So let me quickly uh, take you to our uh, institutional pedagogic approach that led to the technology integration in our teaching and learning. So I was already uh, mentioning that our teaching and learning strategy follows certain principles. Now, among these principles, there is an emphasis given on three of them, that learning to be an active process, learning to be student-led, and learning takes place effectively in a community of learners. So in order to put these principles into practice, we adopted a pedagogical approach called the flipped learning model. Now, for those of you who are new to flipped learning model, it's basically a pedagogical approach, uh, which uh, 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 wherein the traditional way of uh, teaching and learning is flipped. Uh, in other words, the students are provided with learning materials before the class and the class time is utilized for active discussions, uh, practicing problems or applying the concepts they have learned, or they can uh, debate on what they have learned uh, they can ask questions, uh, not only to the teachers, but also to the peers uh, as well. So this project we had trialed in the year 2015, and after its initial success, it was institutionalized. Now, what we found is for such an approach to be uh, effectively implemented, uh, technology is something very important. There are educational uh, researchers who argue that technology is not necessary for a flipped uh, classroom, but we do believe that technology plays a very important role in having an effective pedagogical system to be in place. And also we believe that the learning materials that we provide to the students before the class, which I was mentioning earlier, is something very important uh, because that is uh, important for the students to get a complete idea of the topic before the class. So even though we have materials uh, uh, which could be provided in a digital format, like a PowerPoint presentation or a lecture note or a, a research article, generally what we find is that the learning materials in the form of uh, videos with some kind of multimedia technology in it have strengthened the motivation of the students to go through the materials before the class. And uh, there are research uh, papers uh, which do uh, talk about uh, this particular aspect. And also even during the class, in order to uh, facilitate say a brainstorming session or to create a group discussion forum, we found that information and communication technology tools play a very important role and have been found to be effective. So we embedded technology in our classroom that enabled us to conduct interactive quizzes or similar kind of activities. Most importantly, what we have found is the students are really uh, actively uh, getting involved in the activities uh, being designed for the students in the class. So uh, as a whole, uh, what we realize is that uh, the use of technology aligned to the pedagogical approach has an impact on making the students autonomous learners. We see uh, we can create a dynamic teaching and learning uh, environment uh, where there is maximum participation of the students. And uh, we see collaborative learning happening 
uh, it's not just the teachers being the facilitators in the class. We see uh, uh, students also as uh, uh, facilitators. Now, let me uh, quickly uh, take you uh, to show you how effectively we have implemented this pedagogical uh, approach with the use of uh, technology. Now, the most important aspect is the uh, continuous professional development for the staff members and the necessary IT infrastructure expansion. Now, since this approach was institutionalized, we could provide a focused uh, uh, staff training as well as focused uh, development of the uh, technology and the necessary infrastructure. Now, we have Center for Academic uh, Practices, uh, which provide uh, staff uh, uh, training or the workshops conducted as to uh, get equipped with the pedagogy and the associated technology and the tools. And as far as uh, uh, infrastructure is concerned, a fully equipped multimedia studio was uh, created so that the teachers are able to create their own video lessons. Uh, streaming servers were uh, made available for uh, better utilization of the resources. And we already had a learning management system in place, Moodle. Uh, where uh, we could organize our lessons uh, in a, a very appropriate manner. Uh, this also helped us in uh, having some kind of uh, assessments like some of the quiz assignment. We, the, as teachers, we were able to provide feedback uh, through the system. Now we have uh, Turnitin, which is a, a plagiarism detection tool, uh, which helped us to uh, check the academic integrity of the uh, work being submitted by the uh, students. Now, something very uh, interesting is that the uh, teachers have been encouraged to uh, use innovative practices aligned uh, to our teaching and learning uh, strategy and the best practices had been awarded. So this had actually been a, a real encouragement to the uh, teachers to be more creative and uh, they tried out uh, several uh, uh, innovative practices. And as a result, uh, uh, many technology-led teaching and learning innovative practices have evolved. And uh, many of them are uh, uh, currently being adopted in the uh, institution widely across the uh, departments in the uh, institution. Now, uh, this is uh, just to give you a glimpse of the various technological tools that we have been uh, uh, using in our uh, college in order to take our uh, pedagogical approach uh, forward. Now we got these ICT uh, tools uh, being used in both the synchronous as well as uh, asynchronous manner. We have also used uh, massive open online uh, courses from uh, different providers, some of which we have uh, embedded in our, uh, uh, in our curriculum as well. So which helps our uh, students to be uh, independent learners and uh, lifelong learners. Now, uh, I would like to quickly uh, take you to yet another very interesting project that uh, we have uh, done with uh, our partner university. Uh, this is to promote the internationalization uh, in alignment with our uh, uh, internationalization strategy and uh, teaching and learning strategy where uh, there is an emphasis on uh, engaging staff and students uh, to get engaged beyond the uh, campus and also for the students to provide a, a creative and distinctive uh, learning uh, experience. So this is called uh, uh, Collaborative Online International Learning or uh, COIL, we call it. This was undertaken in collaboration with our partner university in UK. Now, one of the key elements of this particular project is that the students must uh, get engaged in some sort of online interaction and that's obvious because it's international learning and uh, uh, the interaction is uh, between the students who are located at two different uh, places. Now due to the difference in the uh, time zones in the UK and uh, Oman, uh, this project was uh, undertaken in an asynchronous uh, manner. Now in order to uh, implement uh, this, I'll just quickly uh, take one uh, example here. Uh, for implementing this uh, project, we have chosen a common module to our uh, college and uh, our partner university, uh, Coventry University. And then internationalized learning outcomes were uh, framed, uh, like for instance, uh, to exchange knowledge and ideas on a 
common topic and uh, widen their knowledge in a global uh, context. So uh, based on this uh, set of activities were uh, planned and uh, students have started working on the tasks that have been uh, given to them. Uh, of course, this was mentored by the staff members at uh, both the uh, uh, organizations. Now they shared uh, uh, their uh, uh, solutions uh, in a common uh, platform. And for this particular project, we have used uh, Open uh, Moodle as the platform. Now solutions were uh, provided uh, by the students. Uh, for instance, uh, our students have provided solutions from a local context kind of, and uh, because it is with respect to the Middle East region context, it had uh, obviously uh, became a global uh, scenario for the students at Coventry University and uh, vice versa. Now students, so with this uh, project, the students got opportunity uh, to peer review the, uh, their work and also uh, make uh, critical comments on uh, their peers' work. In fact, this was one of the components of their uh, summative uh, assessment. So this project has uh, not only uh, enabled the students to improve their digital skills, but also they were put in a, an environment where uh, students are from uh, different cultures uh, coming together and having a collaborative kind of uh, learning. So um, whatever I had been uh, mentioning till now uh, are the teaching and learning practices that were happening before lockdown. So when we had to move from on campus to online mode of teaching, our principles remained the same. Uh, so most importantly, we could continue with the same set of uh, practices that uh, we were uh, doing. Uh, only the, the, except that uh, we had to do it in an online uh, platform. Um, we used uh, Microsoft uh, Teams uh, for the um, online uh, uh, mode of, uh, for the online mode to happen. Uh, so what we uh, felt uh, is that, we felt that our pedagogic approach is something perfect for the online uh, mode of uh, teaching. And this is the reason I was mentioning in the beginning that we were proactive in having a strategic approach to our teaching and learning. And this had actually enabled us to do an easy migration at a faster rate. So staff and students were uh, uh, digitally competent. We were having sufficient uh, infrastructure already in place. So we could get adapted to the uh, new mode of uh, uh, teaching and learning environment. And additionally, uh, we provided uh, remote access uh, of our computer labs to the students so that they were able to uh, access the proprietary softwares, uh, which are in our uh, organization to be accessed from uh, their home. So, uh, so what, we, uh, what I would like to conclude here is that uh, uh, we have to choose technology uh, uh, which are aligned to our pedagogical approach. Um, uh, we know that we are living in the fourth industrial uh, revolution uh, era where uh, we have uh, lots of uh, disruptive technologies and we know the kinds of applications that are coming up every day. It's just making the way we uh, live. Uh, it's just making a difference in the way we uh, live and uh, think. So, however, we believe that if we adopt a particular technology and if it is not aligned to our pedagogical approach, these disruptive technologies may become destructive tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smita. Uh, now, uh, questions are open. Okay, I have a question. Uh, yeah, uh, looking at the online uh, you know, transition from offline to online based on the strategic approach, uh, you were able to address the key areas like you know, skilling the uh, educators or the staff through uh, your uh, uh, staff development activities and you know, center for academic practices. Uh, access to technology was widely available and curriculum and assessments were very well planned to you know, meet the requirements. But one thing uh, the, was like, what was uh, your institutional approach towards cyber resilience to ensure that the students are able to use uh, digital platforms in a more safe and ethical way? Uh, because you know when they go online, they are as you were telling, there are a lot of disruptive technology and disruptive uh, things. 
So what is that uh, institution approach towards creating awareness uh, to the students on use of this digital platform in a more safer way or in a more ethical way? Okay. So I think uh, this is something which we need to address in future because uh, when we have adopted the, uh, uh, adopted this online platform of Microsoft Teams, so we are uh, under the impression that the Microsoft uh, Teams is uh, providing a required uh, feature for uh, all the uh, participants uh, uh, when they are uh, involved uh, in the online uh, uh, teaching and learning processes. So uh, I think uh, this is something which we need to look at, which we need to plan ahead. Uh, if at all, uh, we have to be very, uh, 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 like, you know, uh, we have to be very uh, uh, looking forward for being secured, uh, to be in a secured uh, environment. So that is something to be look, look, look forward. Yeah, this is something which everybody has to, you know, uh, consider while uh, teaching and doing an online teaching and learning processes, because it's very uh, important for this younger generation to guide in a right way to use of yes. online tools and technologies. Yeah, I have a question from uh, Rachapa. The this question is, how did the how did Middle East College uh, conduct the assessments uh, and evaluation processes in uh, you know a secured way when you are going online? What was your methodology? So, uh, the, uh, we had an alternative uh, assessment strategy, uh, which uh, had been adopted for this particular situation. And since we were already having an assessment pattern, like an assignment uh, submission uh, on uh, Moodle, which we were already practicing. So in this difficult situation, we had adopted the same uh, set of uh, assignments here. So we never had any uh, time constrained examination uh, because we could not conduct it uh, uh, on campus. So as per our uh, revised uh, alternative assessment strategy, we went for the assignment uh, uh, mode of uh, examination, which is just an online submission on the Turnitin link, which we have uh, on mobile. Uh, there's one final question I can take up before we go to the next one. Uh, Dr. Prakash is asking, uh, what was, uh, you know, it was student participation and engagement in online teaching? Uh, what could be, you know, what agencies wanted to know is really uh, students were really engaged and participated in online teaching and learning or what was the student feedback in regard to online teaching? Yeah, that's a very uh, relevant question. So uh, uh, basically, uh, we, that was one of the challenges that we had faced. Uh, the student engagement uh, was uh, pretty less uh, uh, because attendance was not compulsory. And there were genuine reasons also like uh, the students who moved to their uh, villages when there was a lock lockdown. They had inter internet uh, connectivity issues. Some of them not having uh, the uh, gadgets or the laptops uh, to uh, be online uh, during their scheduled uh, class. Uh, so those were some of the challenges that we had faced with the undergraduate uh, students. But if, it, if I can make a comparison with the postgraduate students, uh, the scenario was uh, totally different. We had almost 100 percentage attendance in the postgraduate uh, classes. Probably they were uh, already uh, in a part-time mode of study and they felt this kind of uh, uh, mode of uh, teaching and learning is uh, much comfortable compared to coming to the college after their work and so on. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith. There are a few more questions, but some of them are generated. Let us keep it towards the end of the session with all the panelists. Uh, yeah, so now let me uh, introduce uh, the next presenter. Uh, Dr. R.K. Kamath, uh, who is head of uh, computing department uh, at Shivaji University, Kolhapur, India, and the director of innovation and incubation and linkages, and also director of internal quality assurance. Uh, he would be speaking about automated teaching, uh, research, and beyond the evolution of technology so how the technology uh, so how the technology will be able to you know uh, make the teaching and learning in a more uh, easier way and keep 
students engaged in the teaching and learning processes. So Dr. Kamath would be speaking on that line and uh, over to you, Dr. Kamath. Doctor, unmute. No, uh, still it's not. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Mr. Chandra, for such a nice introduction. I hope my slides are visible. Uh, as of now, no. Uh, could you please, it just says double click to enter the full screen mode. Yeah. yeah. So thanks. It was nice uh, hearing the talk by Dr. Smita, and I would like to take it from the last point she has mentioned, that is from either towards disruption or uh, uh, you can say uh, the other way around. Actually, I'll be speaking from a different perspective. And she was mentioning about Moodle and uh, so many more technological tools. So basically, I'll be taking it further. And I would like to focus this topic from a different perspective. That is how one can go about automation in teaching, research, and uh, even extension activities. So how this technology evolved in this particular direction. Uh, basically, as she has rightly said, this is uh, education 4.0, that is similar like industry 4.0. And the challenge is educating a generation that knows everything. So that's the great challenge we have, and it's called as Google generation. Uh, given my background in electronics and computer science, it really helps me in pursuing the research activities in this particular very exciting domain because I work at the interface of hardware and software and there is an area called a neuromorphic computing. So I basically do a lot of research in neuromorphic computing wherein uh, we do a lot of uh, simulation of human brain. Uh, we do a lot of uh, studies on uh, neurological aspects of pedagogy. So that really helps me for this particular topic. At the outset, I would like to make it clear that many symbols, resources, they have been taken. And I have made it a point to acknowledge all these things in the presentation. So basically, uh, it is well agreed that education system doesn't need to be reformed. Actually, what is need is it needs to be transformed rather than reforms. And this COVID-19 pandemic has really forced us towards this transformation. So therefore, it's all about uh, learning. And learning is the basic crux of the entire teaching learning process. So we need to apply basic principles of learning and uh, the neuro neuroscience while going for the technology. So there was a lot of discussion in the earlier talk regarding the engagement of the students how to measure the engagement of the student, students, how to increase the engagement of the students, and then how to design the technological gadgets so that students will be more engaged in these technological domains. That's a real challenge. You know that uh, uh, as a child, we learn towards self-directed explorations in life. For example, our kids, we never teach them how to walk, or our kids, we never teach them how to speak, speak or construct the sentences. But just following us, just following the environment, they just uh, go about the learning the sentences, learning the language, even the gestures. So they go about the gestures and so, so many things. They learn on their own. But when it comes to our classrooms, we really wonder why students struggle in classes. So uh, I think there is something wrong. So there is a mismatch between how we teach and how the brain learns. And therefore, if you see, all the technological gadgets 
all the technological uh, uh, the, the blogs the even the if you look at the social networking everything behind this is the how to bridge the mismatch between how we deliver the things and how brain learns the things and therefore it's all about how we, we can make the learning more and more, more additive so that's very important in this particular domain uh, there is lot of nostalgia because when i started my career there used to be a kodak standalone camera and now it has moved towards uh, the kind of smart camera in the smartphones even we used to work on the ohp projectors but now there is lcd or even the more advanced projectors we have the multimedia projectors we used to just talk about the chalk and talk but now lot of things are going about the smart smart and interactive boards right from the blackboard we are moving towards the whiteboards and more towards the interactive boards so there is lot of technology which is going into the classroom and if you see the evolution of the technology as a media we are going from something like the radio or the television we used to have the channels dedicated towards uh, the extended c band i remember for uh, delivering the contents in distance education but now everything is multimedia we are talking about the soft soft radios nowadays so in this particular uh, scenario what will be the future of universities in ai and blockchain world that's a really question we should ask ourselves and there is lot of hype in this so if you study the gartner hype cycle it it says that uh, there will there will be no universities or there will be no classrooms or even there will be no teachers but i personally don't believe in all these things and given the kind of rich heritage we have in indian higher education system because it all started today we are talking about the internationalization but those those old days this vedic vedic period wherein the hindus the viharas the madrasas they contributed a lot towards the internationalization even we used to have the scholars right from the globe towards india for studying so this kind of internationalization which we nowadays we speak about but those kind of things are happening from our uh, past and there is a lot of heritage we have as far as the globalization and internationalization of the education is concerned and given the fact that now we are more into the technology this will certainly fuel the kind of uh, internationalization that uh, we are talking about and therefore recently i had a book uh, which is authored and uh, this particular book you, you can see here i have symbolized a gurukul and in this gurukul it is just a transformed gurukul wherein the same kind of philosophy but now nowadays it is going on with the different kind of gadgets and different kind of tools and techniques we have so we are talking about the flipped classroom we are talking about the moodle and we are talking about the new techniques and tools so that is very much possible with this kind of uh, scenario uh, the first and foremost question is why we should do all this so the thing is there is a generation called a generation g and most of our students they are from that generation g so this generation g students they have their own kind of perceptions they have their own kind of habits it's like uh, they are uh, technology born uh, kids and most of our uh, teachers they are technology immigrant kind of uh, kind of professionals so there is a gap in the classroom itself the technology born kids and technology uh, immigrant teachers and therefore if you want to Uh, bridge this gap as uh, dr smita was rightly pointed out the kind of change in mindset is required the kind of uh, training is required and that is possible by inculcating the kind of uh, pedagogical framework in the institution itself but generation g is the foremost thing that's why we are going towards the technology and well she was talking about the flip classroom and flip classroom is the need of uh, the hour because whenever we are dealing with the technology born students and uh, if we uh, if we deal with them in the traditional classroom manner then you know the result is very much clear that the students are no more interested they are they are almost disengaged and therefore engaging engagement in the technological domain is a real challenge nowadays and therefore we must look at uh, what are the things required in today's classroom or per se 21st century classroom so in this 21st century classroom every student must have a voice 
the second thing is that every student must have choice so choice is very important important that's why we are talking about the choice based credit system nowadays and even the credit transfer and all other things and this is very much possible to to globalize by using the technological tools the third most important thing is there has to be time for reflection so which is very much possible with the flipped classroom kind of technology the fourth thing which is important is opportunities for innovation so given the technological platforms and given the projects uh, to the students there could be different kind of uh, solutions from the students and it gives a room for enhancing the innovation and uh, bring, building a culture of innovation amongst the students the fifth thing which is very important in this global classroom or 21st century classroom is we need to nurture the critical thinkers what students are looking at us as a teachers in the technological domain whether we really uh, give encourage their thinking critical thinking and critical thinking is not only nowadays life it's a skill but it's a life skill so that's a very very important thing the sixth and uh, other thing which is important is we need to have problem solvers and more than problem solvers we must have problem finders because the student should be able to study the environment and then the student should come out with the kind of problems because ultimately we want to groom these students as the uh, the, the the researchers or the innovators or uh, even the citizens who are very much successful so for this they must be able to find out the problems amongst themselves because if they can locate the problem then only solutions are possible the self assessment is a very important aspect so evaluation is a really important aspect but more than that the self assessment is very important and the technological tools they they should give a chance to the student to go for self assessment and then the other the thing which is very important is connected learning so this is talked about uh, because nowadays we are talking about uh, team quotient social quotient so these things are possible and these things can be very well harnessed by using the social networking tools so one of the days wherein there was only iq was important but nowadays we give lot of importance to the social quotient we give lot of importance to the team quotient and more than that we give lot of importance to the emotional quotient of the students so i'm sure that given the kind of technology we have we can uh, do this so as i was uh, mentioning what's important is uh, how to make the learning addictive how to make the learning interest interested how to in increase the engagement of the students in the technological gadgets so actually as rightly pointed out by this well known philosopher steve jobs so we need to identify the problems before the solution and therefore the solution is to study the brain to study the neuroscience behind this before the before the design or deployment of the technology what's important is what is the crux behind this so the neuroscience is very very important and therefore nowadays uh, there is lot of ai artificial intelligence is going in the neuro in the pedagogy and therefore neuroscience is uh, really playing a lot of things in the today's pedagogy you know that brain is like a muscle and the learning helps to build the neuron connections and it can really save from lot of things so learning is very important learning gives the joy and this joy is basically comes from the part of the brain which is called as vta vta in brain so it's a novelty center and whenever you learn the new things then there is a secretion of dopamine and with the secretion of dopamine there is a kind of joy the students are getting and this motivates us towards the rewards so in a way if you want to make the learning addictive if you want to design the apps if you want to design the portals if you want to design the gadgets then the core and foremost thing is you must uh, design it in such a way the user interface and other things they should be designed in such a way so that there is lot of rush of dopamine there is lot of uh, rewards given to the students after they accomplish a certain thing the best example in this case is the facebook so uh, we we use facebook and uh, the main uh, main thing about the facebook is if you just plot a graph of pleasure versus the familiarity then facebook is designed in such a manner that they they manipulate this graph in such a way so that if there is a lot of familiarity then you don't get a joy if there is a totally no familiarity for example if the facebook posts are in a language that is not known to us then again there is no pleasure but there is a some kind of balance they keep between the pleasure and familiarity 
so that there is a lot of uh, joy the reader gets after reading the facebook post post and it is well said that by a facebook uh, engineer that there is a lot of dopamine driven feedback loops which is embedded in the facebook so why can't we use the same things in case of our gadgets or the same thing in case of our uh, portals and the apps then only it is possible to to have the addictive kind of learning behavior so that's very much possible and uh, you know that uh, today with the social structure we can have only 150 connections face to face but given the kind of uh, potential the facebook and uh, whatsapp and other uh, other youtube like things are having so you can you can get to connected to many 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 learners on a global scale so that's what the uh, there is lot of uh, research which is going on in this neuromorphic computing and uh, they are trying to make it as a learning as a addictive activity learning as a activity which can really give joy to the learners there is a recent paper i i would like to mention uh, here it is published in nature and they talk about uh, the delayed rewarding kind of uh, activity so the delayed, delayed rewarding which is given to the social networking users so basically it is said that instagram notification algorithm uh, if you just uh, post your uh, image or snap on the instagram you don't get uh, immediate attention of the users but after certain time they the it gets flooding with the likes of your uh, snap or something so that gives you the kind of reward and it's called as reward prediction error so this reward prediction error is the basis of all the apps and all the learning management system because uh, dr smita was mentioning about the moodle so there are latest versions of the moodle and latest versions of the learning management systems which have got built in psychometric test which can make out uh, what are uh, uh, the slow learners and advanced learners so even they can make out uh, even at the at the advanced stage the right brain dominant learners and left brain dominant learners so in a way if we have this kind of right kind of principles embedded into the technological gadgets and technological devices then we can have the kind of uh, uh, the justice to the learners can be given so but basically i was talking about lot of artificial intelligence is going into uh, the apps and uh, the portals so basically here not only the learners or the academicians are gaining from the technology but technology is also gaining from the learners so what can be learned from artificial intelligence how to deal with the short term memory loss how how to go about the information overload overload because given the rate of obsolescence of knowledge which is awesome so we need to have some mechanism so that we can deal with the information overload and we should pass on all these skills to our learners even how to deal with the distraction so that is possible in so in this way ai can really reimagine the education and at the same time the algorithms in artificial intelligence they are also getting from uh, the learners because in a way they are trying to emulate the brain they are trying to the, the kind of apps and the kind of bots today they are taking up the higher education so basically they want to emulate the 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 teacher's brain they want to emulate the teacher's psyche they want to emulate the teacher's style of teaching and the pedagogical principles so in this way not only the learners are getting from the technology but the technology is also getting from the learners and therefore uh, the kind of gaps in the classroom uh, one can bridge a small experiment there was a lot of discussion in the earlier talk regarding how to measure the engagement of the students it's very well possible because nowadays even there are uh, something called as uh, the eeg uh, recording uh, headsets so this is a headset which can which the learner can wear and there are only three electrodes because i come from the biomedical background so here lot of applications exist for this kind of setup so one can have the brain wave eeg pattern and with this it's possible to really make out whether the student is engaged or not so with the pattern going to the teacher's dashboard the teacher can make out whether the student is really attentive whether the student is really progressing in their learning and therefore if there are any requirements of correcting the style of the teachers then it's possible even this can go as a feedback to the parent smart smartphone so that they can make out where, where, whether their ward is really doing well in the institution even a kind of brain typing is also possible the placement agencies can be can can make use of this by looking at the kind of uh, grasping the student the student has so that 
whether the student is useful for them, even the skilling and skilling is also possible. And these kind of things are, are even given to the students for personal meditation, like yoga and other things, they are possible so that their concentration can be enhanced further. Even the brain training is also possible. So these kind of setups are now coming up uh, in a big way in this technological domain so that uh, even the technology can be uh, can be inculcated in the classroom. However, there are concerns like privacy, data interpretation, ethics. There are so many things, but still uh, these kind of things are coming up. So there are, uh, I have one or two real-time applications. There is a very good, uh, you can see that uh, I would like to just give a demo of one or two. Let me just try this. I hope you can see this. So uh, it will open very soon. So these kind of technological gadgets are coming. So wherein you can now here, here the aim is the system is telling you to draw a cat. My drawing is not so good, but still see. And the system gives you feedback that what is the next step of the drawing. So in this way, you can go ahead with this or you can have something like this. So these kind of things are really exist. Even Google has come out with a big AI kind of applications. And with this, the performance measurement is possible because once performance is measured, the performance can be improved. And once it is improved, then we can accelerate the improvement of the learner. So therefore, uh, even uh, a new thing which is coming up in the classrooms is emojification of the classrooms or learning. So here the emojis are very important because the generation G learners, they believe uh, in lot in emojis and they communicate through emojis. So therefore emojis are also important. The last point I want to make is the, what is important is technology is not really important. What is important because teacher is not replaceable. So retention rate of the learner is important. So you, you can see that this is a traditional learning pyramid. And in this traditional learning pyramid, if the retention rate is 5%, if you just lecture, it is 10% if you read, it is 20% if you go for audio visual, and it is highest 90% if you make the students as a teachers. So that's why we encourage seminars and other things in the classroom. So with the technology also, the same thing is true. The technology has to be used judiciously in the classroom. So if you just use your PowerPoint or multimedia or uh, these kind of gadgets or apps, and if you go about the passive kind of learning, then the retention rate is going to be lower. But if you go for the active learning kind of things, for example, students recording the videos and giving back to the teachers for evaluation. So these kind of things will really enhance the engagement of the students. So in nutshell, the modern learning, there is a, the legs of the table, there are many legs of the table, such as the learning management system is important, the infrastructure is important. We are talking about zero curriculum nowadays, looking at the prerequisite of the students, so this is important. Most important is education of the parents, so that's also really plays a lot of uh, things in this online education. Technical support is important. So in this way, uh, in this era of uh, uh, education 4.0, what is important is there are many dimensions towards the technology mediated learning. The last slide, I want to discuss the issues and way forward. So AI, like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning or deep learning is really going well into this particular uh, domain of pedagogy. However, there are still certain issues like uh, the gender bias is there because if you just look at the Alexa or Google Home, by default, uh, they have female voices. So that is a big concern nowadays uh, expressed in the technological world. Technology learning from human is really uh, we should uh, take care about because uh, human learning from technology is really, there is nothing to worry about because human being is a really intelligent and they can make out what to learn and what not to learn. But technology learning from human and uh, emulation of the brain is really going on. So that's a, uh, there is a worry that we are creating more divides in the societies. Already there are divides in the society and uh, there is a lot of racism and other things. But when the technology and bots, they will learn from human being, it is said that it is believed that this kind of things will increase. And therefore there are a lot of ethical issues. There are issues pertaining to the privacy of the technology and rightly pointed out by Chandra 
even the security, the cyber security, cyber bullying, these are also issues. So therefore, uh, whenever we go about in having this technology in the pedagogical domain, we should be a little careful. So that's from my side. And as uh, rightly pointed out by Bill Gates, technology is just a tool and it helps in getting the kids working together and motivating them. The teacher is the most important. So therefore, the role of the te teacher, even in the technological era, is really important. Teacher is not uh, replaceable. The teacher needs to delight the students. The teacher needs to uh, tap the untapped potential of the students. The teacher needs to, uh, you can say, kindle the curiosity of the students. Because as rightly pointed out by Socrates, education is just like kindling of the, of the flame and not like killing the vessel. So kindling of the flame is very, very important. And therefore, we must help our students, even in the technological domain, the teacher is not replaceable. So therefore, though we are talking about automation of uh, teaching and research and so many things, the beyond part is teacher is not replaceable. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kamath. Uh, it was really a very interesting one and show how technology can be you know, embedded into a teaching and learning process to make uh, student engagement uh, with much more fruitful. But as you finally said that uh, the it also has its uh, you know uh, negative effects also. Uh, so in line with that, now uh, okay, now based on this current scenario, most of uh, universities and colleges are moving uh, to online uh, teaching. So do you think this trend will continue, or uh, will they get back to a normal offline teaching once the situation gets settled down? Uh, yeah, this yeah. yeah, I think uh, the, the trend of online teaching is going to be continued, but the most prevailing trend which is going to come up is the blended learning because online is not the solution for everything because I was talking about the divides and the divides, there are many divides like the divides in terms of uh, the technological gadgets, the divide in terms of, today it is said that internet is, a, is, a, is the biggest platform but the internet is, is not penetrated well in almost all the nooks and corners of the countries like India. And given the number of uh, the, the population, even equipping the students with the right kind of gadgets is really a challenge. And therefore, there are a lot of divides. So online is not the ultimate solution. It's not the 100% solution for uh, the coming days or it's not the ultimate solution. So we need to have some blended kind of solution. We need to have something like the flipped classroom kind of solution because as far as the as far as india is concerned we have a lot we had a lot of experiments like uh, nptel is there or swayam is there but these experiments they did not uh, go well they, they could not be absorbed well by the student, student fraternity and therefore uh, this this thing should be experimented in a limited manner and the future is i think the blended learning okay uh, so uh... I have a question uh, from uh, Gajanan. Uh, listen, what are the most appropriate uh, technical tools which are best in for conducting, you know, the lectures? Uh, yeah, uh, there are so many tools. Actually, I just wanted to demonstrate. I'm not sure whether there are so many tools. For example, I will show you. Oh, I hope you can see my screen once again. Uh, Can you see? No, still not. Uh, just showing a started sharing, but I'll, I'll just start sharing. Yeah, now? Uh, no. Okay, anyway, uh, what I'll do is uh, uh, there are a lot, lot many tools like uh, the Zoom and uh, uh, the Office, uh, the other tools like. Uh, team and other things. They can be used for teaching learning, but they are not the right kind of tools. So more than that, there are tools for recording your videos. And uh, there is a tool, very interesting tool called as TED tool. So this TED tool will trans transform your video just like a TED talk so that you can add your notes to that uh, TED, TED talk. And then you can uh, send those videos to your students on a uh, email forum, even WhatsApp forum. And then you can have the feedback from the students. So these kind of tools are possible. Google has come out with a Google AI laboratory. So in, the, in just Google, you can browse the Google AI laboratory. So there are many tools 
which can be used for uh, teaching learning process. So they are they are come they are they are, come, they are actually designed many tools as a open source tools, and those tools can be embedded in your teaching learning uh, process. So in this way, there are so many tools, and most of these tools nowadays they are open source tools, so they are affordable to both teachers and students. Yeah, I think uh, you know these tools and all are complementary to support uh, right. the actual teaching they one could be. But they are not just a replacement for a uh, you know, teaching uh, uh, by the faculty himself because it prevents the students from a uh, you know real world engagement. Otherwise, sitting at a corner and then so in that case, uh, the universities and colleges could be replaced with something like uh, you know Upgrad or uh, you know various other things which offers online education. But that will never happen with the kind of scenarios or the kind of situations what we have across India. Uh, even it's difficult to get. You know, penetration of internet, as you were telling. Uh, so, but uh, currently they are trying with you know live broadcasting over the national channels of television for the classes and other things, which is a mass communication way of uh, doing. Uh, at least uh, they are trying their bit to you know, uh, support the students doing this. But I think that is not the only way what we can go ahead. So, still we'll go back to the campus once the situation improves. Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, your time and. Uh, if there are some other questions, we'll take it up at the end. Now, the next uh, uh, presenter is Dr. Charandas Vasidas, who is a co founder and executive director uh, of CARDET, Professor of Learning Innovations and Policy, Associate De uh, Dean of uh, Learning, University of Nicosia. Uh, he would be talking on uh, accelerating digital transformation, challenges and opportunities for online education. Uh, over to you, Doc. Hello to all. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you some experiences. Thank you to the organizers for the honor to invite me to share some things with you. And also to the previous speakers who have set up a good uh, ground for the follow-up uh, discussions. Um, <clears throat> so here we go. Uh, I assume you can see my screen now. Um, I will be talking about, um, I'll try to bring together some key issues regarding online education. And uh, in particular, uh, some of the uh, challenges, but also opportunities that we see uh, within this uh, context. I will be sharing some experiences from uh, different perspectives. One is an online learner uh, many years ago, and also uh, from designing online courses. My first online course was this, I designed it in 96. Uh, about 24 years ago while I was doing my PhD in Arizona. And then in the year 2000, about 20 years ago, I was involved in two big projects. One is designing a full online master's degree and then a full virtual high school. 20 years later, my work at the University of Nicosia as Associate Dean of E-Learning, but also at Cartet, we have participated in hundreds of projects working with e-learning technologies. The, the key issue is that Although it's uh, a bit depressing to hear that, uh, this pandemic has accelerated the digital transformation. Uh, things that we've been debating for decades happened overnight. When schools had to shut down, uh, we saw a huge uh, increase on online education. Uh, our university, because we were very ready and we already had uh, a few thousand students online, Overnight, we were able to switch and go fully online also for our conventional students. Um, but this accelerated change is something that although there was resistance for many decades from different actors, uh, this has been achieved, whether we like it or not, and it, it's here and it will stay, and it's a fact. So uh, what I would like to talk in the next few minutes is some lessons uh, we learned uh, and also some key issues behind this. You know, the first assumption is that online education and distance education is something new. 
Well, it's not. Distance education, if we go the other way around, the traditional schooling, the way we know it today has about a century history, okay? That's what it has. For thousands of years, people have been learning via various modes. Uh, in uh, a, about a hundred years ago, we had the first courses via correspondence at the University of Chicago. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> it was, there was established an organization, the International Council for Correspondence Education, because for many years, the distance education as was taking place was via correspondence. In 1982, because of the many developments in technology, like radio, television, like broadcasting, uh, the association changed its name to the International Council for Distance Education, which marked a new era. And then immediately after that, we had the growth of digital technologies and the internet. The summary of the challenges as we face it have to do with quality and effectiveness. How do you scale from 100 students online to 10,000 or 100,000 and at the same time maintain quality? Equity access, equality, meaning do we have all the same opportunity to participate in online programs? What are the challenges with regards to skills, access, and so on? And of course, issues of accreditation. All these are coming back to surface, but now with the massive scale are even more important. One fact that we know from a lot of research is that if designed well, online education and distance education can be at least as effective, okay? At least. In several cases, we have research that reports that is better. In other cases, we have that is worse. Uh, we can discuss that later on. But the basic summary is that if designed well, and that's a key factor, um, it can be a very good source of education. Traditionally, we had the metaphor of distance, and then there is a lot of discussion in experts by play, calling it distance education or online education. We place the emphasis on the first part of the name the distance and the online, whereas our focus should be the second part, the education part. And that's why it's important if we accept that the fundamental process of education, whether remote, online, or face-to-face, -face, is interaction. Interaction of the learner with content, peers, instructor, tools, and experts. And the last important clarification we need to understand is that what happened the last three months is not the normal situation, meaning because a lot of institutions had to jump on online education, it's very different teaching in emergency situations online and remotely. And it's different when you have to time to properly plan and address this online education uh, context. So that's even an important factor. And to be honest, from uh, reading a lot of the research out there now, nobody was really ready for such a mass scale of lockdown. Yeah, uh, and that's uh, a fact. Looking now at the basic issues that will help us rethink a few things regarding the challenges and opportunities, we have the context always within an education institution. If we accept that we have to, the learning design in which the previous speakers already discussed in a lot of detail and the pedagogical approaches and mapping what we want to achieve with the right tools, it's very important. But there are several factors we need to be aware of. For example, for the interaction, when we design for online learning, the immediacy of interaction that we have in a face-to-face -face situation, it's still not the same even if we do a Zoom class online and we have a live connection. It's, we, we, uh, the human species has not evolved that much yet and the technology has not reached that much yet to be able to approximate the physical experience of sharing 
a round table together discussing and debating with each other. Uh, the coherence, the engagement, the visual contact, all this has strong implications for designing such programs. And the previous speakers already addressed them, so I'm not going to discuss them in detail. One important aspect that uh, I would like to focus a bit on has to do with the construct of social presence. You know, one of the biggest challenges that we're going to face right now is mental health. There is a lot of research out there that shows that because of the challenges we face, the isolation, the remoteness, uh, there are serious problems emerging among our students and also teachers. And the construct of social presence, as it was proposed in the 1970s, refers to uh, the capacities of a medium to allow the user to feel socially present within a distance education context. As these things evolve with the remoteness and the online education, oftentimes we saw a big push on reaching out to learners, uh, making sure they're okay, but at the same time covering the curriculum. Uh, but this has strong implications of the follow-up because not everybody has the equal access. Not all students have fast internet or internet at all. And in many countries, uh, online access is not even an option for a large percentage of the population. So that has strong implications of what we can achieve and how we design distance education programs thinking around all the complexities. Uh, another important component is skills. We all agree that our teachers uh, need support and professional development. No matter how well prepared they are, still, I don't think many institutions were prepared for such a mass scale of online education. So how do we reach out to all this? How do we support our teachers? Another important component is the skills of the learners. Meaning, how do we uh, ensure that our learners will have the skills needed to actually uh, support and participate in online education? This is not something that can be achieved easily. So we need to think about how can we support our learners to be effective online learners. And last but not least is the families. Maybe in higher education, that's not the case, but in, for all other levels of education, primary and secondary, most of the teachers had to work with parents to have constant communication with parents. How do we all get them on the same page for that? So, Several of these issues were already discussed, so I'm not going to spend time on them because we're, uh, a lot of things were discussed, but we can come back later and address some key issues of them. Um, one important aspect of this online education uh, boom is a lot of uncertainty was out there. Uncertainty about a lot of things. Will universities and schools open? How will they open? Who will go to school? Teachers, teachers and learners, some of them. Will we have some online, some face-to-face? -face? How will we handle the health protocols? The health and safety are important. How will we address all the curriculum and missed classes? The issues I mentioned earlier regarding mental health, isolation, resilience, support, and how we maintain positive relationships that we can actually get back on the groove and move on with what we have to do. A few of the things we learned is that we were not ready. So let's not kid ourselves. Very few were really ready, but nobody expected such a big shutdown. So, but we learned a lot. We learned about the importance of systemic change, the role of families, the fact that change is here and it will stay. Okay, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, research coming out now that says that 
the impact on those marginalized groups will be for a lifetime. Those who will be greatly affected by the lockdown and what they missed during this pandemic is all those learners who were on the verge of dropping out or not making it to the next grade or whatever other issues they had. Now with the lockdown and this uh, 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 drastic change, are the ones who will be impacted and it will most likely see the uh, the learning gap and digital divide to be even bigger. We also saw some, <clears throat> we, a lot of these myths we hear, um, you know, online education is easy and we can switch to it next day. Well, it's, it's not as simple as that. I mean, if we think of online, of a video lecture and a collection of PowerPoints, we have to think again, okay? Uh, if we want to have quality education where learners are engaged, it takes a team to design such courses. Um, the other myth we hear a lot is that online education will never replace face-to-face. -face. This is based on the very false assumption that the face-to-face -face is the most effective way of teaching all subjects, all learners, uh, and all uh, working with all teachers. Well, the research shows exactly the opposite. We all know schools are failing. We hear from many countries how things are not working well and that the traditional school, we need to revisit. So the assumption that the face-to-face -face is the best model is wrong. So another uh, myth is that online is here for a supportive role. Well, if we had it only for supportive role, nobody would go to school for the last three months. And definitely for the next few months, we'll still have big problems. So it's not for supportive role. Uh, yes, the blended model is good, but the blended is like, we're trying to decide. We like online or we like face to face. Huh, maybe I'm not sure, so let's blend it so I am safe. Well, it doesn't work like that. In some occasions, we have research that shows blended learning is a very good approach. But we also have research that shows that the online in some subjects and areas can work fine and even better. So let's not make the assumption that for everything we go for the blended model. And of course, the myth that online is, will work the same well for all learners, all teachers, all subjects. It will not. Okay. So <clears throat> going a bit fast, so I know that uh, we're already behind schedule. I think one of the key, if we accept that there are three main areas we want out of education, knowledge, skills, and character, okay, I will focus on character because the other speakers focus on the other aspects. Character. What do we mean by character? Positive, resilience, positive relationships, the, uh, the ability to adapt to change, okay? We run a big uh, project right now focusing exactly on that, and you can learn more by visiting this. We see a lot of the things now, what our learners need, they need us to reach out to them to make sure we're okay, reconnect, and then start the process. We should not just go and say, ah, oh, you missed five classes, let's share the material. We have a role as educators to actually reach out and make sure everybody's okay, help them relax, calm, reconnect, and build on it. So a lot of issues, I know, <clears throat> We're running out of time, but as a concluding, I would summarize it in the following. We need to look at the whole online education uh, situation now in a systemic. <clears throat> the, the pandemic forced us to accelerate change. Accelerating change doesn't mean following the Band-Aid approach. It means we have a, an opportunity to rethink our education systems, our processes, teach what is important, leave the rest for others, think about having <clears throat> uh, alternative plans, uh, invest on in our teachers and be adaptive. And all this by having at the center our learners. <clears throat> I will stop here and I will allow the time for uh, discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, <coughs> in, in fact, uh, we are running out of time, so I'll take a couple of questions. Uh, so open to all. Uh, the first question is, yeah, as uh, uh, 
Dr. Rasidas was telling, uh, it shouldn't be a case where, uh, you know, uh, we are like the graduates are COVID affected graduate over a period of time when they approach for, for any employability aspects because uh, everybody rushed towards online teaching methods, but did we ensure quality assurance processes over there? So who looked at the quality assurance process because we see that the exams are not being conducted, assessments are not being, the students are being moved to graduations. So at the end, after the students should be like, you know, we are like COVID affected graduates. So what is that, how we can ensure that there is a quality assurance process, even if we go with online, you know, teaching and learning, is, is there any, uh, because yeah, everybody moved to online learning, but did anybody focus on how to ensure quality assurance also in this period? Uh, it's open to anybody wish to take up the. I can start and maybe yeah, Professor no. Kamad and Dallas sure. can turn. There is no answer for that. Nobody was prepared for such much a scale to implement overnight quality assurance processes for uh, over a billion of learners globally. That's the truth. Now, if we go a step backwards though, and connecting it to the pre previous speakers, but of course, to our project meals that focus on strategies for online education, those institutions who had a solid strategy and all the processes in place, will, I'm sure they would have been much more prepared to tackle the quality aspects when you are asked to scale. But if you don't have the basics in place before you go to scale, there is nothing you can do to ensure quality if you jump to scale without a proper strategy in place. Talking for my institution where I work at the University of Nicosia, we have an excellent process in place, an excellent mechanism we, we, that was fairly smooth for us. And the reason is that we already had a lot of online learners and we already invested a lot on technology and infrastructure and a strong support mechanism for all learners. So if a learner first behind, there is a call center instantly. It's not like send an email and wait a few weeks and see what happens. So there are a lot of things that can be done. So I will let others come. Thank you. Yes. I think uh, Dr. Rasidas has really uh, gave a very informative view regarding the entire online process. And the most uh, challenging part of the online education is character building. The holistic personality development is really a challenging thing. And I think uh, the accreditation agencies like NAC or other agencies, uh, they need to come out with uh, certainly a altogether different kind of framework in days to come. And that itself is a challenge because nobody uh, foresees this kind of situation. And the most uh, fundamental thing is, uh, as I said, that we are all uh, hardwired for learning. So as a kid, we could learn so many things. So we are hardwired for learning. However, when it comes to online, when it comes to technology mediated learning, there are a lot of challenges. There are a lot of failures. And therefore we need to think about uh, how to bridge the gap between the face-to-face -face learning and online learning. We need to come out with certain uh, metrics so that certain parameters and a new framework for quality accreditation, even that is the need of the hour. Yeah. Dr. Smitha, you want to add anything? Uh, you're muted. Yeah, even uh, before uh, the lockdown, the uh, quality, uh, internal quality assurance mechanisms were in place. So we had continued with uh, the uh, existing uh, quality assurance mechanisms. For instance, uh, the peer review of the learning materials that we provide to the students and uh, the uh, uh, head of the department observing the uh, classroom. Uh, as far as assessments are concerned, we have the internal moderation external moderation, so all kinds of quality assurance that were in place uh, during the on-campus uh, mode were continued to be there uh, for the online uh, uh, teaching time also. Okay, uh, thank you. I, uh, I just want I to think, add just one, yeah, one sure. sentence. The need of the hour is we need less standardization, but more personalization. So yeah, that could uh, be the essence of the quality accreditation framework. True. Uh, I think uh, it is like an unprecedented situation which nobody expected as Rasidas was telling, but we had to reach and meet out to that expectations of all the stakeholders and uh, made us to, you know, 
uh, look into the way we can uh, transform ourselves and deliver uh, in a better way of teaching and learning. Uh, but there's a long way to go, how to integrate, you know, how to bring uh, uniformity across the universities, if you look at in India. And uh, a lot of uh, investment has to go on infrastructure development itself uh, to make it more happening, uh, which is uh, really a long term, uh, I, I could see, at least for the Indian perspective. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, offline uh, faculty engagement, real world engagement with the faculties, which is much needed. I think more than uh, you know the teaching the technical contents or the you know, courses, it is more about psychological uh, you know support what students need at, is need of the art. So because they they are confined to one place, not interacting with the people uh, in the classes, which we generally see uh, even I see at my home, you know, kids not able to interact with their friends and others in the class the way they used to do. So they need a lot of psychological support at this, and uh, I think use of more and more. Uh, uh, you know, more interactive technological tools rather than just restricting ourselves to Zoom or video calls and making presentations, which will really, you know, demotivate the students, uh, bringing them more uh, self-studying kind of thing where students can explore themselves, find out what are the best methods, uh, what keep them active. Uh, I, the, as uh, Dr. Smitha was showing in the presentation the last, there are so many tools which uh, will make uh, learning active as Dr. Uh, you know, uh, was suggesting, uh, Kamat, like, you know, AI, um, uh, bringing AI into the things to know the cognitive skills and how students can learn. I think this is what being done a lot of, uh, you know, online platforms where uh, the students, based on their capabilities, the questions are built into, to build confidence in them. Yes, they can attend, they can approach to that, they can answer and then raising their level of, you know, interest in the courses. Otherwise, uh, student would get distracted and uh, maybe the progression rates and the retention rate could be an issue because student might drop out of the courses because they feel they're not interested, they're unable to learn, which is one of the biggest challenge. Uh, so keeping in all those things, yes, there should be an appropriate blend of uh, the tools and technologies with uh, the touch what the faculty generally give to them. And with that, I think we can do a better, uh, you know, uh, uh, adaption to the kind of situation what we are going through and hope we'll be able to come out of this as soon as possible and get back to our campuses and then use these technologies in teaching also to make it more interesting among the students. And thank you all uh, for participating and uh, it was nice interacting with you all. And thanks to all the participants and putting up their questions and some of the questions I couldn't ask, sorry, uh, but I'll put it across to the panelists and uh, share the things. Uh, and you, know, you will get this recorded uh, session where you can refer in future if you require uh, for any of the you know, content you want to refer back. And if you have still any questions, you can just send it to us. We will send it across to the, all the experts and then we'll get back to you. Thank you once again. Thank you all.